here, amen? Praise the Lord. All right, well, let's open our Bibles, if you would, this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter number 19. Interesting, I was uh, been thinking about uh, the message this morning for the week, and uh, I was like, well, it's Labor Day, so how in the world does that go with Labor Day, amen? <laughs> but our messages don't have to go with the uh, holidays, but the Lord does do things, isn't that interesting? Isn't it neat how the Lord kind of makes things work out? Huh? I mean, if you, if you don't understand that, then there's a problem, amen? Isn't it interesting how the Lord makes things work out? He sure does make things work out, doesn't he? When we see things that are impossible, he makes those impossible things become reality. And uh, I just like to see that and be a part of that. And know that, that uh, don't, don't look around and look at numbers. Don't look at all those things. Make sure you're looking at the Lord because God makes things that are impossible come to reality. And uh, actually, in all reality, our church is a living proof of that. And everything that the Lord has done for us is living proof of that. And I'm just thankful to be a part of it. Amen. You should be saying the same thing. I'm just thankful to be a part of it. Amen. Uh, if we'd be thankful more, uh, we wouldn't be looking at so many negative things. Are, are you listening? If you'd be thankful more, uh, we wouldn't be looking at so many negative things. Amen. Uh, so instead of looking at all the negative, why don't we look at the positive? And I'm just thankful the Lord has allowed us to be a part of this ministry. Isn't it a blessing? If you look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 6. Uh, 19 and verse number 1 and uh, verse number 7 and uh, I just pray that the Lord will speak to your heart like he has mine look at verse number 1 if you're there say amen if you don't have a Bible this morning we do have it on the screen but there, verse number 1 <clears throat> and Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in a field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see, that, will I, that I will tell thee. <clears throat> and Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father. Notice he said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee. And because his works have been to the word, how much? Very good. For he did put his life in his hand. And he slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it. Hear that? And disrejoice. Trying to remind him. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood? To slay David, here I like this, without a cause. And Saul hearkened unto the, the voice of Jonathan, and Saul sware, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. Dearly Father, Lord, we need you this morning. And Father, I pray, Lord, that uh, we'd recognize that. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit of God would be free. Lord, I pray you'd clear our thoughts. Lord, forgive us, Lord, of our sin. Father, I pray that we'd have a clear channel to hear from you this morning. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't hinder the Holy Spirit of God, not hinder the Word of God. But Father, each and every one of us are here. Uh, the reason why we're here is to worship you. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts through the living word of God. And Father, we'd be careful to praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We just did a uh, something right before the message. It's called offering. Amen. And our, we give our tithes and our offerings and our faith promise. And uh, we did a lesson with the men yesterday. And uh, what we learned is not that we give because of the law. 
But when we give our tithes to the Lord, basically what we're saying today is, I need you. And when we give our money to the Lord God, that is our way of saying, God, I need you. Boy, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame uh, when you talk to a Christian today and they say the only thing the church wants is our money. Let me tell you something. God doesn't need your money. The church doesn't need your money. But I'll tell you one thing that God would want you to do is to need Him. Proof of our need of God is in the offering plate. When we give to the Lord of our finances that which sustains us, we're saying, God, you can sustain me. Are you following? So when we give our tithes, we've got to have the right attitude and the right heart. When I give, I'm saying, God, I need you. I need you more. Lord, I need you. What a blessing. You know, the Lord wants to know that you need him. You know, here we see that issue here in just this little small clip of verses. We see the attitude and the heart of man, whether they truly need God or not, don't we? Isn't that a shame? Well, the title of the message this morning is Labor for the Lord. <clears throat> labor for the Lord. Uh, you say, uh, why is it uh, uh, labor uh, for the Lord? Uh, but let me, let me help you. Tomorrow is Labor Day, isn't it? Amen. And uh, I don't know if you know what Labor Day is, but uh, Labor Day is to supposedly supposed to celebrate the, uh, the, the average worker, to give them a day off and thankfulness for your part in, uh, in what you do. <laughs> Amen. I always like to look at it spiritually, don't you? And just so you know, we don't get rest Till we get to heaven, amen? And just so you know, labor for the Lord isn't work, isn't exhausting. And so if you are exhausted where you think you need to take a time off from church, then you're not really serving God because it's not labor. The Bible says, take my yoke upon you for it's light, amen? It should be a joy. Like when the Lord said that it was a joy for him to die for you on the cross. It was a joy for him to give you an opportunity to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. So you know, when your attitude of laboring for the Lord is that it's hard, depressing, discouraging, you're not really doing it for the Lord. <clears throat> I hate to tell you that. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, amen. <laughs> if we're going to give in the same attitude, it's wrong. Did you know that uh, the Pharisees gave in abundance? But God didn't really receive that. The woman gave with hardly anything, if you remember, two mites, like two pennies. The Lord gladly received it because she gave of all. She gave of her need. You know what she was saying? This is all I have, but I need all of you. Yeah. Notice the difference. Pharisees wanted to give of abundance of what they had to show how much they gave to others. A little bit different, isn't it? A laborer is one who uh, toils. It's a toilsome occupation. I'm just telling you the meaning of labor. Uh, it requires strength and skill. A laborer is one who puts effort into things. A laborer is uh, uh, unavoidable, isn't it? Huh? Is there anything that you don't have to labor for? My dad always used to tell me that, uh, uh, that uh, if you wanted anything, uh, you had to work for it, right? Anything good, you have to work for, right? I've never got anything really free. I mean, I did win something one time, and I can't remember. It was that little Pac-Man thing, that little Pac-Man game. Of course, that was before I met you. And I was like, you know, I'm just like you. I never win anything. I, I remember we used to go to get our shoes at uh, the kids' Kids shoe store. That's probably way before. They probably don't have kids shoe store anymore. It's K E D apostrophe S. And we would go there to get our shoes for school. Amen. And at that time, don't make fun of me. Uh, the popular shoe was the red, yellow, green shoe. Amen. Uh, for the stoplights for kids. And so I got the red, yellow, green shoe. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? 
You say, don't you wish you had those? Yeah, I'd wear them on Sunday, amen. Uh, but, I, uh, but I remember getting those shoes, and I remember filling out a thing at, the, at the, the front. If you buy shoes, you fill out this little form, you stick it in the drawing thing, and you may win this little arcade game that looked like the actual full-size arcade game of Pac-Man. Well, if, you know, I just I filled it out, and we left. You know, big deal. I never win anything, right? And uh, sure enough, they called me a few months later and said, hey, guess what? You won. I was like, no, yeah, whatever. <laughs> You're right. And my mom says, no, they said you won. Let's go get it. And I could not believe it. I actually won it. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Effort. You got to have some effort if you're going to labor, right? Anything that's uh, worth anything, it takes effort. Labor is unavoidable, isn't it? It's unavoidable. Uh, labor is useful. It's useful. Have you ever had a long vacation? The longer you have off, the harder it is to go to sleep at night. Come on, I'm not the only one, right? But you know what's awesome is if you go work a, a, a good solid day, you're not enjoying the work, right? But at night when you go home and you sit down and relax, there's just something fulfilling because you accomplish something. And when you go to sleep that night, you're out. Wow, I've done something. It was useful. There's a useful end to labor. Labor is required. The Bible says it's required for a servant to be faithful. Do you know that is laborer in a sense? To be faithful servant because you cannot please God without faith and faith and faithful go hand in hand. You can't have faith if you're not faithful. Amen. That's why the Bible says in James that if you haven't got no faith, with faith there's works. You don't work to have faith. But when you have faith, there is works. It's a consequence of faith. So in a sense, faith is labor, isn't it? Hmm. But remember what I told you, when you work for the Lord, it's not hard. It's joyful. Amen? Even when you're mowing the Sahara Desert, right? <laughs> My wife goes, uh, I'm, what did I mow on Friday? And I mowed the Sahara Desert. This is our field out here. It was so dry. I was in a dust ball. People were driving by taking pictures because they're like, is that a tornado? Uh, but uh, I, was on the, I was on the zero turn creating tornadoes everywhere. And, you know, normally while you're mowing the field, birds are flying in getting the bugs. No, birds were like, I, I ain't going down there. You're a nut, right? They are out there this morning. Did you see them? By droves, or like that guy was a nut. Well, we're sure thankful he cut, right? She goes, Hey, honey, where do you want to meet for dinner? The shower, you know, it was 99 degrees out. Of course, I'm sweating in a dust ball. What happens to dirt on wetness? I changed colors, right? Look like alfalfa with the big white eyes, amen. I was a dust ball. I think that was the dirtiest I've been in a while, amen. But labor is unavoidable. It's useful. It's required. And notice, labor is also not only physical, but it's mental. You can't mow the yard if you don't first put it in your head you're going to do it. Now, Paul, does your yard get mowed? Normally you're like, well, I'm mowing the yard tomorrow, right? You're physically or mentally preparing your body physically to do it, aren't you? Amen? I'm just trying to help you understand some things that David was doing. I'm trying to help you understand. You say, I don't know how David made it. I mean, he's already had a javelin thrown at him quite a few times by the king who brought him in to live with him because he had uh, successfully defeated Goliath. And then the king lied to him, didn't he? Then the king finally allowed uh, Micah or Michelle or Mikael or however you say her name, uh, his daughter, to marry him because he thought he would snare him or trap him, amen? He said, how in all of this mess did David keep his focus right? 
because he was a true laborer for Christ. He was a true laborer for the Lord. You know, interesting thing, if you're truly laboring for the Lord, all those interferences will not take your focus off. I want you to look at something, Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 37, before we get into the message, as part of the introduction, Matthew chapter 9 and verse number 37 it's on the screen there. The Bible says there, it says, Then saith he unto his disciples, that's Jesus, by the way. He said, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the what? But the laborers are few. You know, it's interesting. We see that in this scenario here in 1 Samuel chapter 19 as well. Because we see in the very first verse there that Saul is discussing with Jonathan and all of his servants how to kill the very man that has God with him and how the very man that God used to defeat the Philistines who helped save all of Israel and now we're plotting to kill him. Even without David in that picture, the laborers are still few, aren't there? We see only one laborer. Now, I don't really understand this. I don't know the scenario of your life. But let me ask you, are you a laborer for the Lord? Or will you be like the servants in Saul? Hmm. Good question, huh? The Bible says the laborers are a few. You know what few means? Small in number. This is interesting. This will help put uh, the message together with our Wednesday church history. But you know the word few also has a, uh, a, a, a meaning of remnant. Orthodox. Does that help you? Okay, because, you know, the, remember the Lord said himself before he left this earth, he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the what? His church, not ours. The church that he instituted before he left, not ours. Now, orthodox would mean remain true to the way the Lord instituted the church would always be a remnant there would always be few. Now let me help you with this. I'll concrete it for you. If Jesus was, well, we know he was God. He was the greatest pastor. He was the greatest man. He was the greatest preacher. He was the almighty physician. He was the one and the only, the all-time undisputed, ha, wow, king of kings, right? Let me ask you this. Why in the world was there only 12 remnant? Because there's only, he said it himself, there is only few laborers. Interesting thing is if, you're, if the greatest preacher who could heal people, isn't that amazing? You know, most of them, they wanted to come get healed and they left, but they were not really laborers. They did not have faith. Jesus himself said they were few. Are you one of the few? You know, they get that slogan for the Marines, right? The few, the proud, the Marines. Huh. In reality, the few are the church. The real laborers are few. That's a shame. I want you to see something, number one. The Bible says in verse number one, And Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. I wrote this, number one, my first point is minority. Minority. It's the same as few. That's why I brought to you Matthew 9 and verse number 37. The same meaning as few is minority, small in number, remnant, orthodox. Most people will side with the majority. Who is wrong than to be singled out to stand for what is right? You say, how do you get that out of that? Because there was only one. Now, just so you know, the king had a lot of servants. How many was there? 100? 200? 
I mean, we already know that uh, Saul had like a thousand concubines. The Bible said so. Was that right? No. Saul done a lot of things that were wrong because remember, God gave a description of what the kings were not supposed to do. They weren't supposed to multiple wives. They weren't supposed to multiple horses. They weren't supposed to multiple their money. All the things that they did against the Lord. Amen. So don't say, well, it's okay to have numerous wives and concubines. No, it's not. He did wrong. And that's why he's where he's at. But just so you know, it's a minority. To be a laborer for the Lord is in the minority, and we see it here, even without David there. We know David's a part of the minority, but all of a sudden, out of all of them, here we see Jonathan only. Only. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? They all saw that David was used by God, but only Jonathan. I, I thought that I was fascinated by that. You know, the interesting thing is this. Pay attention. Most people will side with the majority who is wrong. Why is that? Because we don't want to take a stand. We don't want to be laughed at. We need some of God's people to start being a part of the minority, the few. We need some of God's people to take a stand for what is right. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17, it says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye what? Separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Let me say that again. The Bible says, Come out from among them and be ye separate. It doesn't say to side with the majority. The sad thing is, is we know what is right and what is wrong. And we choose to do what's wrong. That's a shame. Number two, I want you to see the second thing about laborers. Laborers are only in the minority. Right? They are. That's why when we go places, they're not riddled with Lighthouse Baptist tracks. Because they're only being handed out with the minority. Are you listening? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just trying to give you an obvious. I'm a life application preacher. Amen. Uh, tracks aren't going to hand themselves out. Tracks are to be handed out by us. Amen. They don't, they don't walk out of here and fly. And can I tell you something? Well, that's a waste of paper and a waste of time. Okay, you're, the Bible says that the Word of God will do God's will. Those tracks have the Word of God on them. Who are you to say that they're not going to do what God wants? Oh, they don't get read. Oh, okay. I've heard a lot of people say, man, I'm thankful you left that track in the bathroom because guess what? They get read in the bathrooms. You can laugh all you want, but people read things in the bathrooms. The best thing they could read is how to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want you to see the second thing we see here about laborers. The Bible says in John, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse number 2, it says, Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. I want you to understand something. Jonathan here shows, uh, I see that he shows no fear. Now, you say, well, why would he be afraid? Well, his, his dad is the king, and he's an angry man. Let me help you with this. I don't believe that there's one male in here that doesn't have some kind of respect for their dad especially when you're young right I had my son working with me not too long ago you know he still has that respect as I'm his father which he should right but you don't really get that until you have your own kids and you see it but uh, sons have a huge respect for their fathers that's why fathers it's really important that you show a demonstrate a, a son how to live their life uh oh ouch right and guess what just so you know if you don't have a father in your life god has placed men in your life godly men if you'll allow them to mentor you just so you know amen get into a good church and there should be some godly men there uh right 
Come on, help me. You see, because I already know uh, men today aren't doing what they're supposed to. Where are they? Why aren't they in church? That's because they're not being godly men. That's shame on them, right? Amen. But still, back to what I was saying, he still has a respect. Yes, sir. You better say yes, sir, right? I don't tell him that. I don't tell him that. You didn't do that right. Well, I, no, no, be quiet, right? Sometimes you got to do that. Your kid won't be won't stop talking, right? At least ours doesn't. And uh, I'll say, listen to me. Now, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. And you go, yes, sir. That's good, right? Thank you for, uh, thank you for showing me respect. He's a man. He doesn't have to show me respect. We see Jonathan, he does have respect for his father because he doesn't say anything to his dad right there in front of all the servants. But he does go to David and go, hey, buddy, uh, my dad, he's got a misfire. Right? David, I know God's with you, and I'm, I want to be right with God as well. And I, I, I don't fear my dad. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. Turn there to Matthew chapter 10, verse number 26 to 28. Look at this. This is amazing. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse number 26. <coughs> Are you there? <clears throat> the Bible says, fear them. <coughs> Excuse me. Fear them not, therefore. For there's nothing covered that shall be revealed and hid that shall not be known. <clears throat> what I tell you in the darkness, that speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them, <clears throat> here it is again, he says it in uh, verse 26, it says, fear them not. <clears throat> and now verse number 28, it says, and fear not them, which can kill the what? which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both the soul and the body, where? In hell. You know what Jesus is saying there? You shouldn't fear. Hey, Jonathan, you shouldn't fear your dad, who's the king, who can kill your body. You should fear God Almighty. And let me help you just a few chapters back. They saw God Almighty work through David. And they knew that God was leading the nation of Israel through David. And now here we see Jonathan who actually loves and respects his father. But here's his father is wrong. Does not disrespect his father. Are you, are you paying attention? Are you seeing a spiritual way to avoid wrong confrontation? Are you paying attention? I'm not going to belittle my dad in front of these servants. Here's where we learn. Here's another principle. Uh, children of God study to be quiet that's in the New Testament do you know what that means we need to learn when to shut up I'm not trying to be rude we got to learn to be to shut our mouth sometimes it's not good to speak yet it would be very inappropriate for Jonathan to usurp authority in front of the servants to the king. Now remember, that was not, it didn't matter whether that was his son. His son could have been, he could have killed him. He had the authority. Don't you disrupt me in front of these. I'm talking here. You, who are you? You see what I mean? He, there's all kinds of principles we can learn here. We see that Jonathan respected authority. Now, he knew it was wrong, but he, he took care of it right, did he not? David, my dad's going to kill you. I'm not afraid of my dad. I'm, I'm just showing you by his actions. I'm afraid of God. 
child of God, are you afraid of God? This morning when you gave your tithe or your offering, did you say, God, I'm giving because I need you, not because I have to? If you're giving because you think you have to, then that's the wrong attitude because God doesn't really have you. God, I need you. Lord, I'm going to give in advance because I need you. This is how much more I need of you. Huh? Well, if you can give that much to the church, then you should be able to give us more. Isn't that the way the world looks at it? You know what? I don't need the world more. I need God more. I, I'm just be honest. I'm, just because I'm a preacher, I'm not superhuman. I'm just as human as you are. I have the same uh, sinful battles you have. I need God just as much as you need him. We see that the fear, the expectation of evil, the passion of apprehension of danger, the anxiety was of wickedness, not of righteousness. Jonathan was not afraid to do that what was right, but he was afraid of that which was wrong. And we see that principle here because he goes to David and says, Hey, my dad is wrong. He's wicked. He's going to hurt you. Huh. That's amazing, isn't it? Let me ask you, child of God, when are you going to stand for what's right? Look at verse number 3 and verse number 4 here in chapter 19. The Bible says, and I will go out and stand beside my father. He's not afraid of his dad. you see that? I'm going to go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee and what I see and that will I tell thee. I want you to understand something. It doesn't say this, but we only know. There's been some conversations with the Lord. Lord, how am I supposed to bring this to my dad who's the king who's angry? We know he's angry. The only reason he brought David close to him was to play the harp because he had an angry, depressed spirit. How awesome is it to be around angry family members? Come on, isn't it great? Huh? Huh? My wife says when, I, when I'm cranky, she goes, you need to go back to bed and wake up on the other side, right? Huh? Go back to bed and wake up on the other side, right? Other side of what? The other side of your attitude, right? Not the bed. Don't blame me. I will go stand by my father. I ain't asking you to do it. Hey, I'm letting you know what his intentions are. I'm going to go. Here's number three, confrontation. Confrontation. Boy, we don't like that, do we? Boy, child of God, we need some Christians who are willing to be laborers for Christ. Can I tell you that laborers for Christ is having no fear, but it's also not being afraid of confrontation. Sometimes confrontation is needed. But right confrontation, not wrong. I want you to see... Uh, Another confrontation that the Bible gives us a picture of. Now remember, we have pictures of confrontation in the Old Testament. And remember, the New Testament gives us uh, the application or reveals that picture. So let's look over at Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter 2. It's 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians chapter 2. It's right after 2 Corinthians Galatians chapter 2, look down at verse number 11. Here's a good picture of uh, confrontation, okay? I've used this before, but I want to read it so you can see it. Are you there? It says, the Bible says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the, what? Face. Because he was to be, what? Meaning he was doing some things wrong. Now this is Paul. He went to Peter's face. Where did he go? Did he go behind his shoulders? Did he go to his friend? No, he went to Peter's face. There's a difference. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Are you listening? But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. What? 
And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Uh-oh. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth, uh-oh, of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them, uh-oh. If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Man, I think there are some Christians that need confrontation. Now let me, help me applica- applica- apply it today. If you can't do it at church and you can do it when you're not at church, what's the problem? Uh-oh. If you can't do that around the preacher, but you can do it when you're not around the preacher, isn't there a problem? Uh Uh-oh. Isn't that what he's telling him? Don't be a hypocrite. Verse 15, And we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. See in here, he's, he's flip-flopping. When the Jews were there, he would live by the law. When the Gentiles were there, he was free by grace. Peter caught that. And he said, shame on you. Right? For by works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the thing which I destroyed, I make myself a what? Transgressor. Meaning if you go back to the law and try to live according to the law, you're a sinner. The sinner just tells you, you, the law tells you you're a sinner. Can't live by the law. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. For I am crucified with Christ. Here it is. Boy, I'm telling you, they take this scripture out of context, don't they? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You know what we need is some Christians who are not afraid of confrontation. Now, confrontation and arguing are two different things. Confrontation is to correct. Peter, you're a flip-flopper. You're a hypocrite. You're a Jew saved by grace, preaching grace. But then when the Jews come, all of a sudden, you act like you're a Judaizer. And we already know that the law didn't save you, but grace did. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You know what he's telling them? He's telling them that if he doesn't straighten up, those who are following the law will be uh, deceived to death and go to hell. Friend, we need some laborers who aren't afraid of confrontation. But I want you to understand, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 19. Look at verse number 4. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee word very Good. Can I tell you something? Now, let me ask you this. This is a, sounds like a pretty good confrontation, don't it? Amen. Now, uh, we've been preaching through 1 Samuel for uh, a little over a year. Can you believe that? <clears throat> been expositorily preaching through Samuel for a little over a year. Remember when I started in the very beginning, and uh, uh, Samuel was supposed to approach because God came to Samuel as a child while he was in 
uh, the temple with uh, Eli. Remember, God came to him and called him, and he goes, uh, uh, he goes, he goes, it gets up and he runs to Eli, and he goes, "Here am I, uh, Eli. What do you need?" He goes, "I didn't call you." He goes back to bed, and he hears it, Samuel, Samuel, and he gets up and he runs to Eli, and he goes, "Here am I. Uh, what do you need?" He goes, "Hey, uh, I didn't call you. Uh, next time you hear that, say, here am I, Lord.'" Remember, he goes back to bed, and, and the Lord says, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here am I, Lord. And remember, God told him what was going to happen to Eli, and that Samuel was going to take his place because Eli had sinned by not keeping his kids right, and that they were all three going to be killed, remember? And the Lord says, I want you to tell them according to how, how I have told you. And remember, uh, Eli came to him that morning and goes, tell me everything that the Lord had said. And remember his approach. I want to help you with something. For being such a young man, he was very mature. I want to help you because Jonathan and David aren't much older. For being young men, they're very mature. You know what I'm trying to help you with? You don't got to be an old person to understand how to be mature. I was watching a video clip, and I believe I shared it this morning on Facebook. It's a shame. There's a preacher. He says he goes all over the world, and he says he goes all over the world, and he sees 15-year-old men. He sees 18-year-old men. He sees 14-year-old men. But when he comes to the United States, he can't even find a 35-year-old man. Are you following me? What we need is some laborers. To show men or boys how to be men. Confrontation is not how angry you can be. Confrontation has nothing to do with anger. Let me tell you something. If my son came and told me that I had sinned and that I was sinning and I was going to sin if I didn't stop doing that, in a, in a, especially now, I would probably tell him, you better watch your mouth, buddy. Right? Well, you don't hang up like that anymore. You go, right. That's a different, right? You can tell I'm old. Hang up on him. Click. How about that? Amen. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? <laughs> We were talking about phones the other day, and how many remembers the phone on the wall? You only got five minutes, you know, to talk to your friends. And my dad says, if you're going to mess up the cord, you're going to sit over there and untwine it, you know, and then you would leave and hang up, and it's all, right? And you better get over there and untwine that cord, right? <laughs> Boy, isn't it funny how we time flies, right? Confrontation. I believe... It had to have been an amazing confrontation. I want you to understand, Saul was king, he was angry, he was depressed. The hand of God had been removed off of his life. He was easily agitated. He knew that David had the hand of God on his life and he wanted to destroy him for that. The hand of God was on Jonathan as well. Dad, don't sin by hurting David. David didn't do anything against you or the nation of Israel. He's done everything to help you and the nation of Israel. Are you seeing his comfort, his approach? Let me ask you, a child of God, how's your approach? Do you know there's a different approach for different in, uh, instances, isn't there? The Bible tells us how to deal with scorners. And I'm not talking about scorners. Don't you be going over to a scorner and go, well, you don't think that that's sin. You should not know. The Bible says to smite a scorner. That's being harsh with a scorner. Just so you know, I don't believe that Saul was a scorner yet. He was angry, discouraged. Irritated, irrational. Remember, he was still in the office that God had placed him in. He still needed respect. Jonathan shows us that. Let me ask you this morning. We need some laborers who are not afraid to confront those whom they love with a warning of their sin. Are you listening? I, listen to me. 
Sometimes you say, I wish someone would come tell my loved one that they're on the wrong track. Well, maybe it's because you're supposed to be the one. I sure wish pastor could come tell my loved one. Isn't it neat how everyone wants to delegate somebody else, right? Maybe the reason why they're on your heart and God hasn't asked me to do it is because he wants you to do it. He didn't say delegate, right? Man, preacher, you, you really got to come visit my great, great, great. I never even met him before. What, what am I supposed to do? Just show up out of the blue and go, well, I'm, I'm Sonny's uh, uh, pastor over here. He's been coming to church for about three months, and I got to set you straight on some things. How's that going to work out? Yeah, I'm, right? But you're their parents. You're their brother. You're their grandparent. You love them. Jonathan, that was his dad. Wouldn't have worked if David would have done it, would it? He'd have been dead. Guess what? Instead of delegating your responsibilities of confrontation, maybe you should own them. You know what? Sometimes people don't get their sin corrected because they haven't been confronted with it. They think that you are enabled. Actually, you know what's funny? We enable more than we confront. Well, I just don't want to deal with it. If Jonathan wouldn't have dealt with it, David probably, well, you say, well, God would have, well, it was God's plan for Jonathan to do this with his dad, just so you know. He spoke good of David, didn't he? Isn't it interesting that when we're not right with God, those who are doing right with God are the ones we hate? Hmm. Hey, you know what? The more you get into ministry, the more you figure that out. <laughs> oh, man, pastor, he's a low life. Man, what a jerk, right, huh? Hmm? Come on, now, now I get to wear the shoes, right? <laughs> yeah, because I remember being on that side. Man, I'm a preacher, why don't you shut up? Right? Huh? Isn't it funny that when you don't want to hear the truth, that all of a sudden the one that's speaking the truth is the one you don't like? Wait a minute, that's all David was doing, living the truth. Oh, we got to shut him up. I think the only way we're going to shut him up is if we all band together and kill him. We killed all the preachers, we wouldn't have no churches, would we? We kill all the Davids and all the laborers, what would we do? Wouldn't have anything to complain about, would we? He spake good of David. You know, sometimes confrontation just needs you to speak positive. You know, that thing that you hate so much has been a blessing. Come on, help me. Huh? Oh, that church represents something wicked and evil. When we used to go there and it was a different name, oh my goodness, you wouldn't believe all the... Who cares? It's not that church anymore, right? And can I tell you something? Buildings don't have spirits and there's no hauntedness here. The Bible says to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And just so you know, the only wicked spirits floating around are demonic. And we've already prayed the hedge of protection around this place. And they don't want to hear about Jesus. Unless you brought them in. Look at verse 5. The Bible says, And he did put his life in his hand and slew Philistines, and the Lord brought a good, a great salvation. Notice the next thing he says. It says, Thou sawest it and did rejoice. Wherefore, wherefore, then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? Laborers not only confront, they remind. They remind. You know, the funny thing is, is that uh, it's not just Christians. People in general forget more than they remember. Right? Hey, remember what it was. 
Remember where we came from? Remember what he did? Father, do you remember that you were rejoicing? Do you remember him cutting off Goliath's head? Do you remember that? Do you remember the Philistines? All of the nation of the Philistines were running away from David. And you want to kill him? Laborers need to be ready to remind. You know, when you get away from the Lord, the first thing you forget is what God has done. Do you know what he's reminding them about? Remember how God used David? You remember how we got victory because of David? Wow. And you want to kill him. People need someone to remind them of what God has done, don't they? You know what this nation, you know what this nation needs? They need some laborers for the Lord that will remind them what God had done here. We have forgot, haven't we? We forgot what freedom is, haven't we? The reason why, uh, the, just, I'm just trying to help you. The reason why everything is chaos right now because of the fact that we forgot what freedom cost. It's ironic that the Lord has told us that we're supposed to remember the past so that we can see clearly the future. Are you following me? Isn't it interesting that the Lord wrote an Old Testament for a picture of what not to do that's revealed in the New Testament? Isn't that interesting? It's interesting that God told the, uh, Israel that they were to tell their children while they're walking by the way, while they go to bed, and when they rise up of what God had done for them. Boy, that's where we've, I'm telling you, this great nation has fallen apart because of the fact that it's falling away. And the Lord needs some laborers that will remind. God needs some churches who are not afraid to labor who will remind them of what God has done. Can I tell you, without religious freedom, there are no freedom. If the, if the government begins, comes in like, they, like they've done in any other country and said the only thing that we can worship in this country is this, if there's no religious freedom, there is no freedom. Because freedom only comes from God. I thought that's why we came to America. I thought that's why you came to Jesus. I thought that's why you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you. Why have you been bound again? Why have you bound yourself again with the bondage of sin? We need some laborers to remind the majority that think of only wicked things of what God has done. Number five, verse number six and verse number seven, and we'll close. The Bible says, and Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. Wow. You know what? If we'll just be used of God, they'll listen. Are you seeing this? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. Now notice, now I want you to understand something. As a dad, that's tough. Come on. For your son to correct you. And then to say, you're right, I'm wrong. That's eating some shoe leather, isn't it? Not only did he say, you're right, I'm wrong. He says, Saul, swear as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in the presence as in the times past. What we see here, when laborers labor for Christ, they reconcile. Number five. When a true laborer labors for Christ, they bring reconciliation. 
Are you seeing this now? Labor's in the minority. A laborer has no fear of man. A laborer's not afraid of confrontation. A laborer reminds. And a laborer reckons, brings reconciliation. You say, what's reconciliation? Remember, the job that we have as Christians is to reconcile people back to God. You say, how is that? I, I cannot reconcile you, but I can bring you to a point where you can get in your life to be reconciled. Are you seeing that? I can show you by reminding you what God has done for you in your life. That's the only way that we're going to get people to a place of understanding that they need reconciliation. Did you know that's so winning? Huh? Maybe your testimony could be used in your confrontation. You say, I don't really know what's going on in their life, but you could say, hey, I know that things are going bad. I know you're having a hard time, and maybe you're working with a coworker and they're having a hard time, and they're telling you a little bit about their hard time. You say, I know your things are going bad for you. Can I share you with a little bit about myself? I had a hard time and I did this and I made these wrong choices. And I came to a place in my life where I said, all right, Lord, I'm, I'm done making wrong choices. God, I need you. I need you to save my soul. Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And since that point, when Jesus came into my heart and saved me, I've had a changed life. Wouldn't you like to do that today? Do you know how many people are looking for a Savior, but there's no laborer out there to remind them, to confront them, or to help reconcile them? How many people are going to die and go to hell without a laborer? If the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few, how much of the harvest is going to go to destruction? Let me give you this analogy, and we're going to close in prayer. If you had a great field, and this was your livelihood, and that field was ready to be harvested, and if you didn't get enough people to harvest that within just a few days, everything that you didn't harvest went to waste, and you wouldn't be able to pay back all the money. Did you know that farmers have to get loans? And based on what they think they're going to make, will pay the loan off and then give them money for the rest of the year. Do you know that? Are you listening? And we don't go out and harvest. Number one, we can't pay back the debt. Number two, we can't take care of anything else. It's destroyed. Friend, the harvest is ready. There are people that are ready. You say, even in this awful time, yeah, even in this awful time, or else the Lord would call us home, the people are ready, but they need laborers. They need laborers that will reconcile, call them back, restore their friendship. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. You see this? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The one who is going to kill him. And he brought David back to Saul. And notice and he was in his presence as in times past. Let me help you with this, child of God. What a good analogy. The Lord wants me to help bring you into his presence. Bring you to his presence as in times past. He wants you to reconcile your relationship so that you can be the laborer that you need to be. What a season for that. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed as my wife plays a verse of invitation. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know where you are, ch child of God. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let me help you with that. Today is the day to get that right. Maybe you ask Jesus in your heart and through the message. You say, oh Lord, I need you in my heart. Father, I need you in my heart. Will you save me? Maybe you're uh, already saved. Maybe there's some things in your life that you're not doing. Maybe you recognize through the message there's some things that you're not doing because you're afraid. Maybe it's be, you don't want to have any confrontation in your life. Let me tell you something, child of God. Without confrontation, there is no testimony. 
They need you to remind them. They need you there to help them get reconciled. Will you reconcile this morning? As she plays, will you come? Will you get your life right with him this morning? As she plays. Amen, amen. I was just thinking about this, and think about this for just a minute. Think about David, the king that he just killed Goliath, you know, right? Was praised and brought into his castle and given all these royal garments, and now he's thrown the javelin at him, what, four times? Now he's threatening to kill him. Now think about David just for a minute. Man, if someone says something bad about you, that's it. You're done. I quit. Not only did David not quit, David didn't have any animosity. Now, I don't know about you. Someone throws some javelin at me. I'm going home telling my wife, man, that stupid jerk throws javelin at me. Man, it cut me off on this exit right here. You could would never believe it. I mean, he could have went behind me and sped up and almost ran me off of the road. And Right. Isn't that funny? brother offended David had all kinds of reasons to be offended and to not why would, why would I want to go over there and who cares about your dad I, let him deal with himself I'm I'm done right I'm not going to be if I got to go if I got to put up with this why in the world do I care about Israel right listen and listen to yourself David didn't think those things did he it's obvious wait a minute Boy, we've got some things to straighten out. Amen. We can't live our life based on what everybody does to us. Right? He was a, what a good laborer, right? What a good example. Now, we're all human. David's human, so don't, don't say how great he is, but he did a good job here, and we can do a good job too. Amen. We can do it. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we love you, Father. We're thankful, Lord, to see these imperfect people here during a hard time, Lord, knowing that we can do it as well. Father, you want to use us as well. Father, you, want, uh, you need labors in this time more than any other time, Father. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't uh, live the life of being offended. But, Father, understand there's opportunity of people that are hurt, that need to hear about Jesus Christ. Father, use us. Lord, I pray that the message would be a seed in a heart, Lord, that would begin to grow. And, Father, that you'd begin to work it in our lives, no matter what our situation is for each one of us here this morning. Lord, it applies to each one. And, Father, I pray that we would let it grow. Father, help us to understand and to see it. And Lord, we love you. Lord, pray you bring us back again this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We give you praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.